Welcome to Beyond the Legacy, an extension of the Civil Discourse and American Legacy Project. I'm Donna Phillips. We previously talked with Dr. Lester Brooks about conservatism and its evolution through our different political parties in our American history. Today, we'll continue to go deeper and talk more about liberalism in the same time periods, as well as the nuances of how our political parties have evolved and changed over time. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brooks. Thank you for having me. Sure. Dr. Brooks, starting in our founding era, how was liberalism portrayed and exemplified in our political parties? The question in that early period seemed to be, to what extent do you believe in the people? Uh, for instance, uh, during the Constitutional Convention, uh, George Mason questioned whether you should allow the people to choose a president. He said that you might as well let a blind man choose colors as let the people choose an executive. So there is that question, uh, do you believe in the people? The Jeffersonian Republicans seem to have more uh, belief in the people. Uh, uh, yet the nuances of these political parties, it's we're talking in generalities. And when you look at political parties over time, there are these nuances uh, and variations, and it's uh, tough to generalize, but that's what we're doing uh, here. So the Jeffersonian Republicans, Jefferson had uh, a great deal of faith in the people, even though he also talked about a natural aristocracy. Uh, so there is this sense of liberalism, this uh, um, belief in the people, the people's involvement uh, in their government. And we uh, uh, see this, although it's hard to look at a direct thread in these political parties from uh, a political party in the 1790s and try and follow it all the way through today. It's just impossible because of the changes in their viewpoints, their ideologies, and the circumstance, uh, circumstances of the time that, in which they lived. Uh, but there is that sense of, of liberalism uh, in the 1790s. And as I said, it was based on uh, how much faith you had in the people's involvement. Uh, by the time we get to Jackson, the Jacksonian age, uh, uh, we seem to see uh, the perception was that John Quincy Adams was more elitist. At least that's what the Jackson, Jacksonian Democrats portrayed him to be. Uh, and so uh, this liberalism would be on the Jacksonian Democrats. They were able to use uh, various electioneering tactics to get the people out. They were much more successful at it than the followers of John Quincy Adams, the National Republicans, uh, the Whigs engaged in electioneering, but certainly the, the Democrats were really skilled at it. And that election of 1828 really shows us an explosion of the electioneering uh, uh, tactics because now there's a popular vote. As of the election of 1824, there's a popular vote. And with a popular vote, that means you have to get the people to come out and support your candidate. So now we see uh, the, the, the uh, cookouts, we see the parades, uh, we see the banners and the buttons and the slogans and all sorts of ways to get the people out uh, to vote. Um, and if we uh, continue uh, into the Civil War and Reconstruction period, now we have the division, the Northerners and the Southerners. Uh, the party of the White South was the Democratic Party. Uh, they would be the more conservative party then. Uh, the more progressive, the more liberal party would be the Republican Party. They were the ones who, uh, sometimes we talk about the radical Republicans. Sometimes people uh, forget that these political parties all seem to have a conservative group, they had a moderate group, and they had a liberal group. And in the Civil War Reconstruction era, the Republicans had a conservative group, they had a moderates, and they had the liberals, which were called radical Republicans mm -hmm. at the time. These individuals, the radical Republicans, believed that government could be more actively involved in providing citizenship for the freedmen. 
Uh, and so we see their attempts to bring about uh, a, a more uh, rights for the freedmen in the aftermath of the war. So they would be viewed as that liberal uh, uh, wing of a political party. Uh, and, and so again, there is that thread of, of liberalism that we see. Uh, and it will continue uh, in Theodore Roosevelt's time, beginning of the 20th century, we see the Progressive Party. And again, it's the idea of using the government to provide for the people. What can they uh, 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 bring about to uplift the people? Uh, so we get the government coming up with uh, various programs that will improve the quality of life for the people. Uh, programs such as the Meat Inspection Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was just one concern of the progressives, uh, that there should be an inspection of the quality of food, the Food and Drug uh, 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 Act. So again, w the quality of food. And so again, uh, trying to use the government to improve the quality of life, so that sense of uh, liberalism. And we can take it on into the 1930s uh, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. So now we're hit with the Great Depression. Well, what should the government's response be? Uh, President um, Herbert Hoover essentially believed uh, in rugged individualism, as he called, let the people solve uh, the Depression themselves. but. Uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt believed that the government should be involved, that the government can help the citizen. And so he comes out with a, a, a host of programs, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, Works Progress Administration, on and on uh, um, to try and help uplift the country out of the Depression. Uh, uh, and so again, what can the government do to assist Americans. Uh, in the 1960s, we now see the civil rights movement as part of, of the government's involvement, trying to support uh, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we're beginning to see, again, there is this attempt where the government should get involved in various programs to improve the quality of life of uh, the American citizen. Uh, so th throughout uh, history, we see this progressivism, this liberalism at different times by different parties uh, in this evolutionary process, depending on the circumstances at the time and the beliefs of the party. And that will continue in, in, into the future. Uh, uh, which party will be more progressive, more liberal, which party will be more conservative uh, um, into the future. And I'm sure that they will uh, change over time. Great. And is there anything else you want to add about um, the nuances of how our parties have evolved over time? Again, it's so hard to talk about political parties because essentially what we've been doing is generalizing. Mm -hmm. We've been painting in broad strokes. And at any given time in our history, we could really get into the nuances of these political parties. And as I said before, we could see that there is a conservative uh, uh, group among each of the parties. We can see a moderate branch. We can see a liberal branch. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to sort of talk about them in these broad strikes, broad strokes, but we have to do it uh, in this sort of format, uh, a, a generalization of these political parties. And hopefully what will happen is the facilitators will be able to uh, uh, uncover the layers that we see in each political party because they all had various layers. They were all at certain times at each other's throats. There were disagreements within political parties uh, about how to, to uh, behave. Uh, there were, for example, just to give you one example, election of 1800, 
Alexander Hamilton was a member of the Federalist Party. John Adams was the candidate for the Federalist Party in the election of 1800. Alexander Hamilton wrote a pamphlet that was critical of John Adams and even said that he wasn't fit to be president. So you do get these squabbles within political parties. Uh, and that shows you uh, how complex this situation, uh, this issue is, political parties, uh, that they're not always in agreement uh, with one another. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. I think that's a great place to end um, and mm -hmm. turn back the conversation to those who are viewing this video mm -hmm. so they can deeply explore different periods of our history and the parties and and the events that have shaped the party's views and actions. Thank you. So thanks again for joining us for this series. Appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you. This has been Beyond the Legacy, a part of our Civil Discourse and American Legacy Project. Thank you.